guest. I'm very, I'm very excited about my guest. She is the managing director of Davis Financial Services in Mitchville, Maryland. She's also an executive director of Money Matters Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. She's a seasoned corporate finance executive who now teaches and advises individuals and couples nationwide about the laws and realities of the money game. She is the, she, she's called the Get Real Money Expert, author, speaker, financial coach, MBA. She's got an MBA from Stanford University, and she built a career as a Fortune 500 corporate executive, corporate finance executive. I want to welcome for the first time to What's in Your Hand, the first time to WHCR, and believe me, it will not be the last time, Patricia a. Davis. Good morning, Patricia. How are you doing this morning? I'm very well this morning, Rick. Thank you very much for asking. Thank you for getting up so early this morning. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are struggling with is the money game. Why is it that so many people are struggling with the money game? Why do you think that is? I think people are struggling with the money game because we have never been taught to play the money game. We play it by accident. And unlike any other game we play, we play it without knowing the rules but expect to win. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's I right. Think people are, I also think people are unwilling to pay for financial advice. That even mm -hmm. when they find out they know something, they don't go to the right people to get the information they need instead. And in our community, I think in particular, if you have a financial issue, you go and ask your best friend, your next-door neighbor, your second cousin twice removed, who doesn't know any more than you know, and you perpetuate not the, what I call the financial illiteracy, which is something we can't afford to continue to do. Right. <laughs> Why is it that people... When you say our community, what do you mean by our community? I say our community because of the community I'm talking to. I am an African-American female. I deal a lot with what I call underserved populations, and I choose to do this because I believe in many other segments of, of communities. There are parents who may have had some different experiences than many in the African American community who have struggled, who don't know how what to pass on to their children, who don't know themselves about the money game, and I I choose to focus on teaching people who are members of the community in which I grew up how to get a better handle on their money, at least how to understand it. I can't make you do anything, but at least if you know the rules of the game. Pardon me, you have a better chance of winning. You know, it's funny that you say that because I speak to a lot of people. I speak to people on the streets and I talk to people and I ask them about their knowledge in the money game. And most people honestly will tell you they don't know anything about the money game. I'm talking about professional people, bus drivers or people from all walks of life. They will tell you I do not know anything about the money game. Rick, may I make a comment? Sure, absolutely. In, in the United States, we have, obviously, 50 states. There are only nine states that require financial education as a part of the core curriculum in high school. Nine. How are people supposed to learn? I have been through four graduate programs, and it was not until I got to the third one that I learned about financial education from an educational standpoint. I learned it at home. I was one of the fortunate ones who learned it at home, but I went through undergraduate school, I went through the Stanford program, there was no financial edu personal financial education in that program. Mm -hmm. So how do people learn it? Well, how do they learn it? Well, they learn it because you have people, hopefully, like me, 
and others who are now trying to help people understand the rules of the game. I tell people all the time, if I were to ask you to drive an 18-wheeler out to LaGuardia Airport in your case, they would say, no, <laughs> I can't do that. And you say, why? And they say, because I don't know how to drive an 18-wheeler. I said, yeah, but you don't know anything about the money game, but you use money every day. Right. What's the difference? Uh, well, you know, not to not to change the subject, but also on the same token is when you talk about eating, a lot of people really, a lot of people really do not know how to eat properly. And so a lot of people end up sick at the doctor. So I think this is another form of miseducation that people have, eating and also their finances. Bad combination. In either case, you get sick, don't you? That's right. That's when right. you don't eat properly, what happens? You get sick, you end up with the doctor. When mm -hmm. you don't handle your money right, I tell people there is a connection between physical fitness and financial fitness. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. If you, and especially with people not handling their money properly, they end up often getting sick. Backache, neck aches, headache, can't sleep. It's all a part of the same game. Speaking of game... I, I'm, I'm a sportsman. I was a boxer, and I, I, I used to play a little bit of basketball in the. You know, I used to play a little ball in the park in the gyms, and I thought I had an okay game. I know some people that are a lot better, but that's not you know that's not the point. But I had I, I thought I had a decent game. I would play and I would get my respect on the court. <laughs> but I kind of sort of kind of sort of understood. I don't know if that's a word, but I understood the game. Where I had I understood passing, that was important. Some guys, all they want to do is shoot, shoot, shoot. They don't understand that passing is an important part of the game. So I say that to say, you know, I'm watching the basketball games and I'm looking at certain players and I notice that some players have a higher basketball IQ. Yeah. You know, even when you talk about boxing, you know, a guy like Mayweather, he's got a, a high boxing IQ. I thought I had a decent boxing IQ, understanding the game of boxing. The same thing applies to, would you say the same thing applies to financial, having a financial IQ and how, how, do, how, do, how does that apply? I think you are absolutely right. The connection is there. Mm -hmm. Some people never learn the rules of the game. Right. But they want to go out on the court, the court of life, and play the game anyway. <laughs> and then there's a prize when they, get a, when they end up in trouble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what is the first step that a person needs to learn when they start handling their money, whether they be young or just say someone's listening to you today? What's the first step they need to do to start getting their money moving in the right direction? The first thing you have to do, I think, is take a look at what you have coming in. And what, you've got to start where you are. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at what you have coming in and what you have going out. If there's an imbalance, as I tell people, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at what you have coming in and what you have today going out. And if there's an imbalance... You either have to get more money in or you have to take some of the expenses out. And what I hear from people all the time is, oh, no, I can't do a budget. Oh, no, a budget is, is too restrictive. I can't ever do anything if I do a budget. And I tell people I think just the opposite. A budget is the most freeing thing you can do. Because if you put it down on paper, and I don't mean just what you have to pay this month, but I mean looking out over the next six months, over the next 12 months, write down what you have coming in and what you have going out. And when I say what do you have going out, I mean everything. I, if you have children, you know at some point you've got to buy children, clothes for the children, birthday gifts for the children. You've got to buy, pay tuition if you've got them in private school, if you have them in summer programs, all of the things you have to do in order to, to pay for your life. If you've got a car, you've got to pay insurance, you've got to pay gas. 
um, all of those expenses, car repairs, but people only want to think about, for example, the car payment. How much can I pay for the car? That's only the beginning. And then you hear them with the oops factor. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's Christmas. I got to buy Christmas presents. Christmas is not a floating holiday. <laughs> Come at the same time every year. Well, it's different. Easter, you say, oh, when is Easter this year? You don't say when is Christmas. But you've heard people say, oh, my goodness, Christmas is coming. Oh, my goodness, my mother's birthday is coming. My mother was born on August 29th, 19-whatever, 19, 19. She had a birthday August 29th every one of those years. She didn't have two birthdays some years, no birthdays other years. She had a birthday August 29th. But yet we don't look ahead and see what it is we have to pay. Mm. We end up spending money foolishly, and then surprised. we're surprised when it's time for the things we have to pay for that we don't have any money. So it's very important to plan ahead. It is extremely important to plan ahead. And the answer is not payday loans, title loans, all those things you see advertised on television, bad news. Mm. And a lot of people uh, talk about their credit. How important is it to have good or bad credit? Does it make a difference? Absolutely. It is the key to, again, managing your money. Bad credit, what people don't realize is that bad credit which leads to a low credit score, can prohibit you from doing a lot of things that you may think have nothing to do with credit. Bad credit can mean, for example, you can't get utilities turned on in your name if you had an apartment. Bad credit can mean you can't get the job you want. And people will say, why can't I get a job I want just because I have bad credit? You have shown that you can't be trusted. Think about that. Wow. The employer doesn't know if you won't pay your creditors. How does he know you'll come to work every day? How does he know you won't steal from him or her? And what people don't understand is that bad credit is a form of theft. You have used somebody's products or service, and you are refusing to pay for it. How is that any different than shoplifting? Mm. Hold on a second, uh, Patricia Davis. WHCR 90.3 FM, Don't New York. I can find other than your office that I can plug this phone in. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Rick Young, another segment of What's in Your Hand. And my guest today is financial expert Patricia Davis. And I kind of heard you speaking there in the background. You know, we could hear you. Sorry. Yes. When did you know that you had the skills to? be successful managing your money? When did you know? I know, I was one of the fortunate people. I learned, and I, I later realized I was one of the fortunate people. I learned it from my mother. My mother was a young widow with five children who said, we're going to be okay, but you're going to do money my way. And we thought she was mean and stingy, but we didn't realize that she was trying to make the money she had last. But she gave us allowances, and that was all we got. We got an allowance every two weeks, and it wasn't for doing chores. It was an allowance because we were part of the family. Okay. And that was the money you got. If you, you didn't not do chores, people say, well, what if they don't do the chores? You did not do chores. If you were told to do the chores, that was a part of your payment for living in the house. But she taught us things, and we watched her allocate her money and we always learned that the light stayed on, the water kept running. There were, no, there were no hiccups when it came to that. And when we grew up, we would say, Mom, please don't teach us. Just give us money. And she said, no, I'm teaching you lessons to last a lifetime. And they did. Allowance is another form of a budget. If you make the children stick to the allowance. If you give them allowance and turn around and give them money when they run out, then you haven't taught them much. Right, right. But we learned that as young people, and we had to, we had no choice. And again, she didn't have anything to give us just because we wanted it. 
just because we wanted it. We had to we had to make that last. If your allowance was a dollar, that was all you got. And you could beg and plead, but it didn't do any it didn't do any good. Now I know you live in D C now. Were you raised in D C? Born and raised in Washington D C, although I spent almost twenty years living in California. Okay. Now they have some areas, from what I understand, in D C that are very, very I don't want to say poor, but economically challenged. Yes. Can you speak to that? There are a lot of areas in D.C. that are economically challenged. Those are, in many cases, the groups that I choose to try to, to talk to about money, to, to give them examples of, of people who've, who've had the same kind of start in life that they've had, but... Th- where you start is not where you have to end up. It's a hard sell if people are already 15, 16, 17 years old because some of what they've experienced is so inbred and ingrained in them. But we have a community that has a lot of poverty. We also have communities in D.C. that have a lot of money. And the relative, the relative poverty sometimes can be very difficult. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to say any names, but someone I knew was taking a trip. And I said to them, I said, it would be a good idea if you made a list of all the things that you needed to take so that when you get ready to take this trip, you could go down your list and just check them off and take what you need to take for this trip. Well, that person didn't do the list because they was like, "Oh, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not good with writing lists and stuff like that." I was like, "Well, you know, I think it'll be a good idea," and but they didn't do it. Do you think that's important to keep records and write things down? Record keeping. Do, do you think that's important? Well, that's that's the same kind of thing you're talking about with the budget. You're right. making a list <laughs> of what you have to pay what you have as resources to pay it with. But if you don't write things down, like your friend who didn't make the list, you get where you're going, and what happens? You don't have what you need. (laughs) Right? Yep. That's probably what happened to this person. They got where they were going. And not only do you not have what you need, but to buy it where you're going, you buy it at the price it is when you get there. Yeah, and then coming back, you can still go through your list and make sure you have everything that, if you wanted to give something away while you're away, you know, you're going with family, but then you have your list of what you have. I think that's the, very important. So that's your guide. Right, okay. And where money is concerned, it's your guide as to what you have to do. If you just spend it, if you just spend it without thinking about it, you get down to the end of, as I tell people, you run out of money. Before you you run out of money, before you run out of month. No, 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 wait a second. We do that. We go out. We have twenty bucks or whatever, uh, whatever amount of money we have. But sometimes we'll break a twenty, mm-hmm. and the next thing you know, it's gone, and you don't even know mm-hmm. where it went, and it's gone. I often say to people, "You, you said you had fifty dollars yesterday, and you don't have any money today. Did you file a police report?" <laughs> I said, why? I said, well, if you didn't spend it, somebody must have taken your money. Oh, I spent it, but I don't know what I spent it on. Again, you haven't made a list. You haven't allocated your money. So what happens at the end of the day? It's gone, and you don't know what happened to it. But worse yet, the next day, you need that money. So what do you do? You go and borrow it from somewhere. I was that was just what I was thinking, Patricia Davis. What would you say to someone that have to come to you or anyone to borrow money? What would you say to that person? <laughs> well, if they came to me, I'd say no. <laughs> My answer is real clear. But they, well, why wouldn't you loan the money? If you if you don't have any, either it's because. Well, it's because you have uh, overspent and you've shown that you're not credit worthy. Wow. So I always say, look, the bank has got more money more money than I have. And if you can't borrow it from the bank, why would I loan it to you? 
Wow. The only thing I might do, depending upon what the reason is they need this money, is give them something that I don't expect them to give me back. Okay. It depends on who it is, especially if it's a family member. If they're behind in the car note, for example, the car is about to be repossessed, it's clear they can't pay for the car. So if I loan them money, how are they going to pay me? If they, yeah. if they can pay me back, they can pay for the car. Well, I'm going to go to an, ex- an extreme level. Okay. Extreme. I was coming out of a store. I'm not even going to name the store, a little coffee shop. And the guy stuck his head in the door and said, can you loan me, can you let me have 15 cents? I came out there, store, I said, brother, come on now. 15, mm. Come on. I, I, I had to, I don't remember everything I said, cause I just, you know, I gave him a talking to. 15 cents? Wow. I said, brother, you got to gotta step it up, man. You have to step it up. I'm sorry. So what did he say? Okay, give me a dollar? No, oh, no, no, no. It wasn't like <laughs> step it up, like ask for more money, but it was step it up. You had to, you got to get yourself together. Something you got to, I mean, you asking for 15 cents. Something's wrong. There's a problem there. Yes. That you need to straighten out. I suggested he get into a program. I said, you need a program, man. And I gave him examples of businesses that are programs. They have systems. And they're hiring. And they're inviting people to participate. But maybe that's not what he wanted. Well, what, no, what I'm saying is that the, these businesses has, has a system. Why can't you have a system with your life? In other words, he needs to be in a program to get a system going. Does that make sense to you? Like, okay, like let's say McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts, they have a system, right? You go to any McDonald's and it's almost the same pretty much. Yeah. Yes. Well, for yes. him to get in a program, some people, we need to be, sometimes we need to be programmed. We want to get on a positive success program. And then you develop a system. I agree with you. Rather, I agree with rather you. Whether it's just waking up in the morning and doing certain things, uh, sort of have rituals in the morning. When you when you get your little money, okay, I'm gonna save this 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 amount. I'm gonna spend this amount. He needs he needs a system. That's the same thing we're talking about with the budget. It is okay. A form there you of go. System. There you go. Right. It's a form of a system. You know, when you get your paycheck, these are the five things that I must do with this money. And friends can call and say, let's go to the club, let's go to Atlantic City, or whatever. And it's a simple, no, I can't do it this, this time. Well, Pat- Patricia Davis, if I have to ask you for 15 cents, I think I'm in some trouble. I, <laughs> I would agree with you. I think I I'm in some you. trouble. You're so in a lot of trouble. Yeah, right. So that was my whole point. And speaking to this, uh, he was actually older than I was, but... I had, to, I had to say, speak to I said, hey, man, you got to get this thing together. This is not correct. You're asking for 15 cents, man. So. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. So what do I say to a person like that? Someone comes up to me, I need, you know, a quarter. I need 15 cents. What, what, do, you, what do you say to someone like that that could lift him up as opposed to bringing him down? What do I say to him? Boy, if I knew, as you say, there there are places that have that provide help for people like that. Okay. But 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 you got to understand, they have to want the help. They have to want the help. And there are people around who, perhaps, have tried to get it, have tried systems that haven't worked for them, and they become discouraged. Okay. And they don't have somebody who again and again is trying to help them unless they're a part of a broader program where somebody is encouraging them continually. But if it's somebody you just encounter when you go into the store and they're hanging out out in front of the store, you may never see that person again. You take a few minutes and you might talk to them about places they can go to get some help that will help them get off the street. But again, if they've tried it, and it hasn't worked. It's like a homeless shelter. There are people you try to tell 
there's a homeless shelter you can go to or a food bank you can go a food um a place where they can go to get something to eat. They don't want to do it. They've tried shelters. They've been robbed. They've been attacked. They don't want to do that. And if, if you don't have a willing participant, then you're swimming upstream on that one. All right, Patricia Davis, let's say that I gave you 100 bucks, and we put you in a city where you did not know anyone. And you couldn't call up a family member or friend and ask them for help. You had to work on your knowledge and your skills in this particular city. And all you have is a hundred bucks. So I mean you gotta eat with that, you gotta live, and then you gotta figure out what you're gonna do. What is Patricia Davis gonna do in that situation? You got a hundred bucks in your pocket. That's it. And you're in some city where you know no one. What are you gonna do, Patricia Davis? Wow. You haven't given me much to work with, have you? <laughs> the, the, well, well, you still have your knowledge and you still have your, say, your wisdom. I have my knowledge. The basic, the basic things you have to cover are food and shelter. You've got some, some clothes, hopefully, that you brought with you. You have them on your back. I'm going to find out from someplace where there's, some, where there's a shelter. I can't spend this $100 on food, I mean on, on um, rent anywhere. I'm going to find some place that's free or a couple of bucks where I can get off the street and sleep. I hope they will have something that they will feed me. If not, I'll go to the store and get a loaf of bread and some a can of something. <laughs> and that well, that's that's all I can do. <laughs> a loaf of bread is not too bad. Uh -huh. and a can of tuna or a can of a pack of bologna. I can't get I can't get hot dogs because I can't cook them on the street. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. So I have to have something that I can cook. But then I am probably going to the library. Wow. I'm going to the library. Wow. And I'm going to start looking for places where I can get a job of some sort. Or places that are that have some kind of, of intern program or something, but I'm going to get some information about where I can, how I can earn some money. That $100 is not going to last long. So I've got to find a way to make it work. And part of it is making me work, uh -huh. finding work for me. So I do have my knowledge, thank goodness. Nobody's hit me in the head and caused me to lose that. I'm going to the library. They have free computers. Uh -huh. And I'll have somebody, if I don't know how to use a computer, ask somebody in the library how I can Google jo job search or some company whose name I saw in a building, some store, go in and out of stores and see if they're hiring. But I first got to get some kind of job. So I can make it past tomorrow. Okay, hold on a second, Patricia. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Young, another segment of What's in Your Hand here at WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. And my guest today is financial expert Patricia Davis. Patricia Davis, what is the difference between the way men and women spend and manage money? In your opinion? In, in most cases, in more and more cases in the, in the United States, women are the financial managers in the family. Women are the ones who are trying to make sure things work. They're the ones who are writing down what's coming in and what has to go out. And I'm not trying to denigrate men in any way at all, but very often... The male turns to the female to say, you make it work, and often will spend money that, that, could not, that should not be spent frivolously, but needs to go in the pot to take care of the, the household expenses. But mama usually will try to make it work, and does. I have a, a book in which I talk about that kind of thing. And may I tell you the title of my book? Absolutely. Mimi was my mother, the young widow who I talked about, who has five children. Mimi, Money, and Me. 
101 realities about money. Daddy never taught me, but Mama always do. Me, me, money, and me. <laughs> 101 realities about money. Daddy never taught me, but Mama always knew. She was the one who made it work. Very often, and, and I'm going back in time a little bit, my father died again when I was young, but I can remember that he would come home and he would give us money. She would come back and take it from us. She'd say, you got your allowance. That is what you have to spend. The money he gave you was house money. And she'd make us give it back. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and she, we thought she was mean, but... You know, if you got your dollar for the week, that was what you were supposed to get. And you had to make the dollar work. And the interesting thing about the allowance was you could do whatever you wanted to do with it. You could spend it all tomorrow. You could save it. You could do whatever you wanted, but you didn't get any more money until next allowance day. Wow. You could cry. You could scream. You could holler. But you learned that that was all you got. And you know why that was all you got, Rick? Why was, why was that all you got? She, first of all, she didn't have us to give us more, but she was teaching us that when you have a job, she said, I work for the federal government. I get paid every other Monday. I know when I get paid how long it'll be before I get some more money. If I run out of money before payday, the Labor Department does not care. They don't give me more money. So you've got to learn that if you run out of money before payday, there's nobody around who's going to give you more money. Well, and the budget is a way of trying to make sure you don't run out. How can a person run their financial financials like a business? What's the best way to, to do that? We just talked about it. It's making sure you spend the money on things that are essential not on things that are frivolous, and that at the end of the day, the end of the month, you have, you have allocated that, those funds so that you are not spending more going out than you have coming in. Businesses do it. Now, businesses also have credit. I mean, they have credit that people will extend to them as a way of running their business because at the end of the day, the creditors know that these people will pay them back. Many Individuals don't have that, don't have that benefit. There's nobody who's out there who's just going to loan you money because they expect you're going to pay it back to them next month when you have extra money. Quote extra money. Mm -hmm. Now, in businesses, they usually have inventory. What is the inf inventory for <laughs> a per everyday person? Because they're running their life like a business now. So, what is their inventory? Well, in businesses, now this is different. In, in, in businesses, your inventory is the product or, ser well, the product or service that you have to sell. For individuals, I guess it really isn't any different, is it? Your inventory is the product or service you have to sell. And usually, that's your skill. That's what you get paid for. Mm -hmm. Wow. Businesses inventory is your skill. Wow. Right. Businesses are selling shirts and shoes and food or whatever, and that's what people are paying them for. People are paying you because you're a carpenter, you know how to build a house, you are a hairdresser, you know how to fix hair. So that skill is what you have to keep your business going. If you don't go to work, guess what happens? You don't get paid. <laughs> if you're a business and nobody comes in to buy your product, you don't get money. So I think that's a great analogy that you made. Right. What is your inventory? Right. Uh, and I think that's, if there's a takeaway from all of this, to ask your listeners to look in the mirror and say, what is my inventory? Okay, let's say we got somebody struggling. A person, an individual, or a family. They're struggling. But still in all, they have a very exorbitant, cable bill what would you say to that person <laughs> learn to read books go to the library wait a minute uh -huh. wait a minute cut the cable off oh horrors what a thought huh 
Like oh no! They like, they like, they like. Oh no! I got to have my cable. I got to have my TV. I got to have my cable. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've heard them. I've heard people say it. I understand, but you also have to have something to eat. You also have to have a place to sleep. Your uh, kids have to have something to wear. Uh, Patricia Davis, I don't want to be disrespectful, but can you fight? Because you <laughs> might have, you might have to put some gloves on. You gonna take? Their cable, I'm t- you got a fight on your hands. You better be ready to fight. That's almost like trying to take somebody's cigarette. Better get I out of here talking you. about my cigarette, huh? I agree with you, but you can't. One of the things that I know for sure is that I cannot create money. I cannot go down the basement and, you know, come back upstairs and I have a pile <laughs> of money. So you, you don't, have a, you don't have a machine downstairs? Huh? You don't have a money machine downstairs? I have no money machine. So I cannot create this money. If the cable bill is $200 and you are finding you're out of money, then you've got to get it from somewhere. And borrowing money to pay the cable bill makes no sense. I had a, a lady once who I was advising, and I did a 12-month budget for her. At the end of the day, she was $3,600 short. So I said, you have to get 3600 I said, do you know what this means, first of all? And her response was, no. I said, it means you can't afford this lifestyle. Ooh. What's on this paper, wow. you can't afford. I said, you either got to get 3600 more in or take 3600 out in terms of expenses. And she said, well, I don't know where I can get some more money. I said, okay, then we have to look at the expenses. Again, you can't create money. So let's look at the expenses. And she said, well, I don't see anything I can cut out. I said, okay, let me look again. Let's start with the housekeeper. She said, like the cable bill. Oh, no. (laughs) I can't tell her not to come. She's been coming for so long. I said, okay, don't tell her not to come. Tell her you can't pay her. Well, then she ain't coming. I bet she'll find somewhere else to go every Thursday. Yeah. I guarantee you she'll find somewhere else to go. But if you have $3,600 more in expenses than you have in income, common sense tells you something has got to go. She had a nine-year-old son. She was a single mother. And she had him for the summer in basketball camp and tennis camp and swimming camp. You can't do all of that. You just can't do it because, as my mother would tell us, money does not grow on trees. Uh-huh. <laughs> At least I haven't seen one. Have you? A money tree? Yes. <laughs> yes. And if so, I would love some seeds so I can plant one in my yard. Yeah. Wow. How about you know, that? The only way I know to get it is to go out and earn it. The only way to get it legitimately is to go out and earn it. And people are, are sucked in by things you see on TV, the the cash point, the the title loan companies and all of that, and they just go and borrow money, but at exorbitant rates. So then when you have to pay that back, that only takes money away from the next month. When I go, they, they, I usually get this magazine, you know, business success magazine I like to read or look at, and... uh in the store, I see people coming in there buying those scratch off cars. Those, oh. I mean, they got the, the board up there. The cars look <laughs> beautiful. You know, the catch for life cars and all the money cars. What do you say about people that invest their money in those those cards? Well, Rick, again, I, I go back to a lot of things I call Mimi isms. Uh-huh. Mimi again was my money, my mother. A fool that his money assumed part it. And that's what you say to people who excessively spend on those tickets. There are a large number of people in the United States who think they will win the lottery, and that's how they will finance their retirement. Mm. There's a large percentage. And I don't think there's anything wrong with buying lottery tickets, but again, if you do your budget, hello, back to budget, and you can afford, say, $10 a week, $20 $20 a week for lottery tickets, then by all means, 
But if you're using the rent money to buy lottery tickets, that's insanity. Well, they got the greatest slogan in the world, a dollar and a dream. Uh, a dollar and a pipe dream. How's that? Wow. A pipe dream. But that's, that's <laughs> an excellent marketing uh, marketing slogan, a dollar and a dream. But like you said, a dollar and a pipe dream. How about but, that? But but ask people, how many people do you know who have, lo- who have won the lottery? Ask people that question. Mm-hmm. And I can assure you, more people than you than say yes will say no. I don't know anybody. And they also will tell you, I don't want to be rich. I just want to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what do you say to that? You can be comfortable. You can be comfortable if you manage the money that you have properly, unless you're just not working at the level that you need to work. Education is a great equalizer. A great equalizer. And I don't tell people that you can get a different level of education tomorrow. It takes time. I have spent years and years and years in school in order to make a better life for myself. Nobody's <laughs> going to give it to you. But you've got to be able to go, be willing to go out and work for it. But the lottery, the other thing about the lottery is the average lottery winner who wins over a million dollars, statistics show, is broke within seven years. Wow. And you know why they're broke? Why is that? They didn't learn to manage one dollar. So they didn't know how to manage a thousand. So they didn't learn how to manage a million. They didn't know how to manage a million. Right. There's a, uh, there's a, you know, I, I did mention about sports. I like sports, and I watch ESPN sometimes. There's a program called 30 for 30. Yes, and they have I've one call. That. They have mm-hmm. one call broke, and it was about athletes, entertainers that made lots of money, made millions, mm-hmm. and they wound up broke. Right, not right. knowing how to manage that money. There were a few things wrong there, though. They didn't know how to manage it. They trusted the wrong people. Yes, and they <laughs> gave in to too many sob stories. Right. Right. Everybody, look at MC Hemp. I mean, he is always everybody's big example. Two hundred twenty-five million dollars passed through his hands. Mm-mm-mm. Wow! And what happened? He ended up filing for bankruptcy. That makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> it, it makes no sense. But that's another. That's another thing in in many communities. People think bankruptcy is the answer when they get in trouble. Hold on, hold on, Patricia Davis. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Young, another segment of What's in Your Hand here at WHCR 90.3 FM. And my guest today is financial expert Patricia Davis. You were talking about bankruptcy? Yes. Yes. What are you saying about bankruptcy? People often think if they can't pay their bills, I'll just file for bankruptcy and I can start over. Right. Well, first of all, the, ro- the rules have changed. You must apply for bankruptcy today, and the court must decide whether or not you can file. And it is a long process that you have to go through, and most of the time, you will be, you, if, if allowed to file, you, you file for Chapter 13, which is a scheduled payback of some of the debts that you have. A Chapter 7 is a fresh start bankruptcy, but the courts are very hesitant to allow people to just wipe out all of their debts. So it isn't simple, but also it stays on your credit record for the next seven years. Mm. So you go to look for an apartment, and there it is on your record that you file for bankruptcy. So nobody's going to rent an apartment to you because you've shown you don't pay your bills. Mm Mm-hmm. The utilities companies are not going to allow you to hook up utilities. But did you know that at one time you couldn't even, uh, people who had filed for bankruptcy were not eligible for combat duty. Combat duty? Combat duty. Wow. It affects people in ways they never, ever knew. Combat duty, and people say, why? Selling secrets to the enemy. If you have shown you need money, who knows what you will do when you go overseas? 
Wow. Well, just because I'm just because I I owe people money doesn't mean I'm a thief. No, but I don't know that, and I'm not going to take a chance on you. So a lot of times people can't get jobs mm-hmm. because they have bad credit. Okay, let me uh, let me have your website. www dot your money whiz dot com. M o n e y w i z your money whiz dot com. And, and there's a lot of information on there about me and the books that I've written. Um, and the, fir- the book, Me, Me, Money, and Me, has great tips in it and the wisdom of Mimi and how she- what she taught us about life and about money. And I'm trying to be the Mimi that a lot of people didn't have because it stood me, it stood me in retrospect, it stood me in good stead. Can you, can a person, let's say a person makes a decent salary, like good money, whether they be a doctor or a lawyer or some profession where they're bringing in a, a nice amount of money, and could they still be struggling with money? Absolutely. I had a couple I was counseling that made $325,000 a year. Wow. He nice. was the one who called me because uh. his wife was out of control. She was a lawyer. He was a salesman. And they had two special needs children, ages two and four, and they had a total of $15,000 in savings out of $325,000 a year. And 15 is not a small amount for some people, but for them it was no money. Wow. And I, told, I said to her, you know, you've got to save more money. And she said, well, I work hard and I think I should have everything I want. <laughs> I said, I mean, nobody gets everything they want. But you also have these two children. And there is no telling when you may be called to come home to take care of these children. Mm-hmm. So then what happened? They had a $500 a month dry cleaning bill. Wow. $500. Wow, they were wearing some serious clothes. Five hundred. Woo! What are you cleaning? Five hundred a month. Thank you. Wow. Not twice a year when you're cleaning the carpet, the rugs, and the the window curtains and the, the the comforters. But this was every month, and she said, "Well, you know, I wear a suit to work, and when I come home, the children want to play with mommy." I said, "Change your clothes." And she looked at me like, oh, what a novel idea. <laughs> what a n- We learned that from little kids. When you come home from school, you change your clothes. You, put, you have school clothes, church clothes, and play clothes. Mm-hmm. At least we did when I was growing up. But $500 a month. And again, you ask me if people who make a, a decent amount of money can still have problems. They were having problems, and he felt that she wanted the diamond earrings. She wanted to go on more trips than he thought they ought to be going on. They had a housekeeper. They had a pe- somebody who did the laundry, all sorts of things. So, yeah. And do a lot of couples have problems because of financial issues? <laughs> that is statistically the main reason couples fight. Mm. And I hear, I hear from young girls, if he loves me, we won't fight over money. And I said, uh, what does Tina Turner's hit record say? What's love What's got to love do with it? Got, thank you. What's love got to do with it? Mm-hmm. It is the main reason couples fight. And you know why they, they fight very often over money? Because they haven't sat down and talked in advance of getting married, of starting the relationship, to come to some understanding of what money means to each of them and what they want money to do for them and to see whether they're on the same page. If you are getting hooked up with a, an alcoholic and you're a teetotaler, you're somebody who doesn't drink, that's not going to work. If you, Rick Young, were to find a young lady who had no interest in sports and hated sports, <laughs> couldn't stand to have sports on in the house, 
would you get hooked up with that person? We would have some issues there. So you would have to keep it moving. Yeah, and that's yeah. okay. But you find out some of these things earlier rather than later. So you have somebody who is a female who wants to shop, 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 and as they say, you know, a girl's got to look good up to a point. And here the guy is over here trying to save for a house, and you're out in the street, or vice versa. He's out running around with his buddies, and you're at home trying to make things work. So something has to give. And then along the same lines of fighting over money, there's the whole matter of financial infidelity. Mm. Do you know what financial infidelity is? Well, break that down. Financial infidelity is keeping secrets about money. All right. Somebody's got a secret bank account. Somebody's got some secret charge accounts. One of my favorites is somebody's got a post office box. Where me up mail isn't even coming to the house because you don't want the other person to know that you've got a charge account at Saks. You've got <laughs> well, if you got the mail going to a post office box, that's that keeps the person the other person from knowing what's going on. I have a story in my my Me Me Money and Me book about a couple where it wasn't until they went to settlement on a new house that this newly married couple, the woman found out, one, the guy had filed for bankruptcy, and her new husband had filed for bankruptcy, and two, had a child support order. Wow. That's financial infidelity. Wow. Well, you know what, uh, Patricia Davis, we're at the end right now. This is this information, I think, has been very valuable. I want to thank you. And uh, let me have your website one more time. dot yourmoneywiz.com. All right. And you can order my book off the website. It is available on Kindle. Um, so you can go on Amazon and get a copy of it. But I think we have to educate ourselves about money. Or we, that's a game where we're not going to win. All right. All right, Patricia Davis, thank you. You have an incredible weekend and an incredible Memorial Day. Let's keep in contact because we got to get this.